threatening Afghanistan's first ever peaceful democratic transfer of power. The Taliban undermines preparations for a landmark poll and stands accused of holding democracy hostage. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. It's something Afghanistan has never managed to do. A peaceful transfer of power from one president to another at the ballot box. There's a lot riding on the outcome. But it appears the Taliban is determined to derail the democratic process. Bernard Smith has more from Kabul. The Taliban's view of the presidential elections in Afghanistan is that they are illegitimate because the Taliban says that whoever becomes the next president of Afghanistan will allow foreign forces to remain in this country. And therefore, anybody involved in the presidential election, whether that be election observers, election officials, even people going to vote, everyone is a legitimate target of the Taliban. And this week there have been four major attacks in Kabul that have allowed the Taliban to also seize the media initiative because it's those attacks that have been dominating the news agenda here. And instead of the discussions being about the future of Afghanistan, the economic future of, Afgan of Afghanistan, these very important issues this country needs to address, dominating the agenda is just will these elections be secure? Will there be enough security provided at these elections? And behind the Taliban's actions all the time, the Afghan government is pointing the finger at the intelligence service of a foreign power. And that intelligence service, say the Afghan government, is the intelligence service of Pakistan. Well, there's plenty to discuss. Let's get the thoughts of our guests for this inside story. In Washington, D.C., Omar Samad, senior Central Asia fellow at the New America Foundation and a former spokesman for the Afghan foreign ministry. From Kabul, Helena Malikia, an Afghan historian who's worked on a number of governance projects with international organizations in Afghanistan. Also in Washington, D.C., we have Tony Schaffer, a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel and Intelligence Officer and a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research. Welcome to you all. Let's begin in Kabul with Helena Malakia. There's a sense that attempts to disrupt the electoral process are only just beginning. Uh, yes, uh, the, there seems to be a, um, a vast campaign by the um, uh, oppositions uh, to, to disrupt the elections. Uh, and this is not a surprise. They had uh, announced this uh, earlier. Uh, that they would do full for they would use full force to to disrupt the elections, and we have been witness to uh, three uh, attacks uh, in Kabul, and of course uh, other attacks in the provinces. Well, Omar Samat, your view on this: the the, the sense that there is a campaign. We've seen uh, the beginnings of it pointed precisely at this electoral process. Uh, are you expecting to see an intensification? Uh, yes, I think everyone uh, expects uh, the Taliban to carry out uh, and make good on their promise uh, made earlier this month saying that they will disrupt the elections and target anyone associated with elections. They don't believe in elections and so on and so forth. Uh, and there are signs uh, indicating that that is the case. One of those signs is that uh, over the last few weeks, uh, hundreds if not thousands of uh, uh, radicalized madrasas in Pakistan uh, have been let go. Uh, the doors have been open. The students have been asked uh, to go and uh, no one really knows why and under what circumstances. And some of these uh, students are presumed to have crossed the border and come into Afghanistan for what they call a jihad, but in reality it's a terrorist campaign against uh, Af Afghans as well as the Afghan election process. Well, Tony Schaffer, we're going to get uh, back to that point about outside interference in a little bit. Uh, but, that right. sense, but that sense that um, there is this focus now on the election campaign, just talk us through the reasons for it. Why are elections such a threat and uh, so opposed to by the Taliban? 
Well, two key points. This would be the first transition of democracy between leaders. Just remember, Pakistan just went through their first peaceful transfer of President Zardari to President uh, um, uh, Sh Sh Sharif. So this is no small issue for the region. Secondly, the Taliban have been waging a very effective behind-the-scenes campaign, fully supported, by the way, by the international forces alluded to. Let me be very clear on this. The only people who benefit from a stable Afghanistan are the Afghans. Uh, Pakistan doesn't want it because of the Indian equation. The Iranians don't necessarily want it because of the uh, equation of the other regional powers. So this is why it's so difficult to actually sustain a de democratic process because there are so many internal influences regarding the Taliban that are fueled by the external influences who have completely different and separate political interests from the government of Afghanistan. Helena uh, Malakia, what is your sense are people prepared to resist Taliban attempts to disrupt the elections? Are you getting a sense that people are intent on going to the polls despite this ongoing threat of violence? Uh, yes, uh, amazingly, uh, with all these efforts and all these uh, suicide attacks uh, of uh, the recent days, uh, people seem to be determined to defy uh, this um, uh, terror tactic and uh, go to the polls. Uh, at least this is what one sees in, in uh, urban centers. Um, and uh, it, it looks like um, people, especially the young voters, um, they, they want to defy this um, um, Taliban tactic and they want to show that this is not going to work and they are going to uh, defend the system that uh, they have been used to for the past decade. Well, before we go into talking about who is going to be taking over, let's actually take a look back at the man who will be departing the presidency. Here's Bernard Smith again. When Afghan President Hamid Karzai leaves office, he leaves behind him a country that remains one of the most corrupt places on earth, a country that's benefited from billions of dollars of foreign aid and as you ask many Afghans here, has little to show for it. And that is how a lot of Afghans will remember Hamid Karzai. But like any president leaving office, Karzai wants a legacy. He wants to be remembered for something positive. And he wants at least to be remembered as the first elected president who then peacefully hands over power to an elected successor. That'll be the first time that's ever happened in Afghan history. So it's important for Karzai that he hopes the Afghans will remember him for this and not the mess that their country is in. And it's also important for Hamid Karzai that he retain some sort of influence on the incoming president. In fact, he's going to be living very close to the presidential palace. There's a house being built for him in the same grounds. And he wants to retain influence on the incoming president because, of course, should there be any corruption investigations, Hamid Karzai wouldn't want those investigations getting too close to him. And he wants to have a role in Afghan society. He's staying here. He wants to fashion himself effectively as some sort of father of the nation, many perhaps in the vein of the last king of Afghanistan. Well, Omar, Sama, do you think that whoever does win this election is going to be free of the influence of the incumbent president at the moment? It depends on who's going to win. Uh, I think that there are some candidates who may fall uh, prey to some level of influence, and there are others who may probably not. It all depends on what kind of final outcome uh, will emerge out of elections. We may also see some type of uh, power sharing between different tickets if uh, a consensus can be built uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, it's a very um, uncertain situation. I don't think that anyone uh, has the ability to predict what might happen, but it is quite sure that Mr. Karzai is going to leave a checkered as well as a uh, somewhat uh, uh, uncertain record. Uh, but they, to the eyes of many Afghans, the glass is half full. It's really not all bad, uh, but there are some real issues that the new government is going to inherit. Well, Helena Malakia, the process itself is going to take weeks. You have got the first election happening. It will take weeks to collate the results from that particular process. Then, if there are uh, no candidate gets a 50%, there will be a runoff election between the two who get the highest amount of votes. 
we are talking about weeks, if not months. Um, is this not seen as a potentially dangerous political vacuum, that process between elections starting and getting a president finally elected? We're certainly faced with, uh, with uh, very sensitive times um, in Afghanistan. Um, you're correct, it will take uh, weeks, if not months, to uh, come up with the final result if everything goes according to, um, to plans. Uh, but on the other hand, um, there is also talk in Kabul about um, certain uh, coalitions that are uh, possibly in the works. Uh, maybe after the first round, um, there will be some talks between the, the uh, three top um, candidates and uh, the, there are efforts in uh, different quarters to, um, uh, to try to integrate uh, the three teams um, uh, somehow uh, in order to avoid a second round and in order to avoid uh, any uh, serious contest of the results that will be eventually announced because there is, there is uh, fear that whatever the, the uh, results, uh, people who are not announced as winners will protest and they will um, go to streets and, and uh, one never knows what could happen uh, if, if this could turn into a violent uh, reaction. So uh, there are all kinds of negotiations going on um, right now, and I'm sure that the, this will be intensified after the first round. Well, well Tony Schaffer, this sense of an electoral process that could bring unity, that could uh, uh, aid the process towards a peaceful future, at the same time it could be creating the very problems that it's designed to end, could it not? Well, absolutely. I mean, let's be honest here. De uh, Afghanistan has no tradition of a, of a central democracy. It's always been very tribal. With that said, let's look back to history in 2001 and 2002. It was the Afghan militia forces. It was a coalition of the willing who came together to defeat the Taliban. So wouldn't it be ironic now, all these years later, you have a similar uh, slant where folks come together for purposes of really sustaining the Afghan interests versus those from outside countries. Uh, I think this is where uh, lo the Loyola Jirga, for example, uh, actually approved the security agreement uh, that U.S. wants to have with Afghanistan back in November of last year. That tells me that there are elements within Afghanistan who do really want to work for the future of Afghanistan. Karzai's influence, I think, has been uh, not the best uh, in the best interest of the Afghan people because he has his own legacy, as you mentioned earlier, to, to worry about. That legacy is something I think has allowed him to overplay his hand regarding that security agreement. So I think the only way to move forward adequately for the people of Afghanistan is to see a coalition of those elements, of those political elements coming together to sustain the government, government as we go forward. And for goodness sake, I'd like to see that they uh, uh, approve that security agreement that Joe Dunford and, and President Obama has put forward to them because I think it's in the interest of the Afghan people to have some NATO and U.S. presence after uh, the end of this year. Well, Omar, sum up that issue of the security agreement, obviously critical, some would argue. Uh, do you think there is going to be movement on that uh, before the election? It would appear not. No, I, I don't think there is any chance between now and next week for any movement, uh, even though uh, you can never be, uh, uh, you know, P President Karzai has the ability to surprise people. But uh, I think that this will be left for the next government so that Karzai can say uh, as part of his legacy that he did not sign it. Uh, what, I what is going to be important for the next government is to make sure that, first of all, there, uh, there is uh, a sense of national unity, uh, politically speaking, uh, uh, as elections end, that uh, everyone to the, to the extent possible feels uh, a part uh, and parcel of a new system, uh, that there is some change from what used to be and that people can look forward to some level of reform. And as part of uh, uh, Afghanistan's uh, way forward, I think that uh, the BSA and the commitments made by the international community, not just on the security front, but as well as on the economic front, are absolutely essential, and the Afghans uh, feel it and believe in it. Well, H Helena Malikia, that particular issue of the economy, clearly this is something that is vital to the stability of the country, but not only that, also, perhaps, to the stability of this electoral process if Afghans do believe 
that it will make the economy better and their lives better. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, the uh, past 12, 13 years uh, that Afghanistan has experienced a market economy, um, the private sector has boomed um, and uh, a lot of people have benefited from uh, the system and from the possibilities and from the projects and, and the money that uh, has poured into the country by uh, the international donors. Um, although um, there has been a lot of corruption involved also on the side of the Afghan officials as well as the um, donor countries, but uh, still the amount of uh, money uh, and projects that have uh, trickled down uh, to people, it has, uh, they have made a very good use of it. Uh, as a result, uh, we are beginning to have a middle class uh, people with small businesses, small to medium businesses, um, uh, employment opportunities have um, uh, gotten um, more and more uh, for uh, ordinary people. These are um, the uh, positive aspects of uh, an economic boom and, and economic activity, uh, which unfortunately um, with the upcoming elections and the uh, uh, withdrawal of uh, US and uh, NATO troops has somewhat uh, slowed down, uh, but, uh, but Afghans do want to continue uh, in this kind of an economy and economic activity. Well, let's just pause at this particular one point. Of the if achievements I, if, if that I they may. want to fight for. The Taliban seized control of Afghanistan in 1996, but it was driven out of Kabul following the US led invasion in 2001. By 2005, it had regrouped in Pakistan and began carrying out attacks on U.S. troops in Afghanistan. In 2009, U.S. President Barack Obama indicated he would be willing to negotiate with the Taliban. But attempts to broker peace have faced repeated setbacks. In 2011, chief negotiator and former president Bahanuddin Rabbani was assassinated. In the past few years, the Taliban's strength and the brazen nature of its attacks have increased. In the past week, it's carried out a series of assaults in Kabul. The issue is, Tony Schaffer, though, that the president who does take over, is the Taliban a domestic issue or is it not? Will anybody who wins actually have the ability to be able to combat the threat or is it an externally sourced threat as well? It was externally sourced. My book, Operation Darkheart, which covers the tipping point in 0304, where you basically went from winning to losing, was all about the safe havens. If not for the safe havens in Pakistan, actually allowing for the Taliban to become strengthened, the madrasas, the radicalization, these are all things which resulted in the, what we see now, this, t this, t this tethering of the Afghan people between them and the Taliban. It shouldn't be like this, but that's what it is. I think we have to look deeper at why this is going on. Again, this goes back to Pakistan worrying about the Indians having leverage. The Indians have been trying to help develop the Afghan uh, uh, people's resources for them. There's a power plant and other things. Uh, so it's this international uh, funding of the Taliban. Plus, the other thing is, uh, let's be honest here, 30 percent of the Afghan economy is, is funded by, uh, by uh, you know, uh, poppy by by the drugs so when you look at this uh, 60 percent of the economy is international aid that's going to drop off it's going to destabilize uh, afghanistan 30 percent is uh, is poppy and all the things that go with the production of of, 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 of illegal drugs and so there's that 10 percent needs to be grown which is the people uh, the entrepreneurship that's got to be the focus of the international community to help that grow and we get at the same time maintain the security issues regarding the safe havens in Pakistan. If we don't do that, you will surely see the Afghan people suffer huge consequences at the hands of the Taliban attempting to resurrect themselves. And unless Pakistan helps, you're going to see a continuation of the Taliban strengthening over the next two to three years. Well, Omar, this issue of Pakistan at the moment, there are peace talks, it is said, underway in Pakistan with the Pakistan Taliban. Yet there are those who are argue that the Pakistan Taliban is entering into these peace talks to effectively buy time. They do not want their bases coming under attack at this particular period when they are focusing efforts on a campaign within neighboring Afghanistan. Uh, do you agree with its uh, thesis? Is there a possibility in it that it is the roots of Af Afghanistan's security problem is in its neighbor, not necessarily within 
the country itself. Uh, I agree. I think that if you take away the, this uh, Pakistan equation, uh, Afghanistan uh, will be uh, safe and stable, and as a result, so will Pakistan. And this is what amazes Afghans, is that Pakistanis do realize that they're facing now sort of an existentialist threat in the form of the radicalization of the system and, and uh, the Taliban uh, being one tool, uh, but that they are not doing what is necessary and that this might really hurt all of us together. So. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know to what extent the India theory flies, because this has been used for decades. Uh, India is, as uh, the gentleman said, is helping Afghanistan in terms of its development projects. So how can that be a threat to Pakistan? But at the same time, I think what, what we're talking about here is Pakistan wanting to impose itself and to gain as much influence, political influence as possible in Afghanistan, strategic footprint in Afghanistan through the Taliban and through radical groups. And there are those who do the bidding and there are those who don't. So uh, what we need to come to terms with, and I think the international community and especially the United States needs to realize, is that if we really want stability in this part of the world, we need to be realistic about the threats and we need to do what is necessary and we need to use the kinds of pressures that actually work. Well, Helena Malakia, is there the sense among Afghans that they are puppets in the great game again, that what they are doing is continually undercut by the interests of forces, not necessarily inside the country, but outside. Is there that sense? Well, um, Afghanistan, by its uh, geopolitical um, you know, situation, has always uh, been um, in the middle of, of uh, games, whether regional games or, or um, uh, big power games. And, uh, and this is one of the unfortunate um, um, you know, things that, that uh, has happened to Afghanistan. But, um, but uh, by the same token, uh, Afghanistan can be uh, an asset. The only thing is that uh, I think uh, the Afghan government um, has not been able to, uh, to uh, fully um, play this game to the benefit of Afghanistan and to show uh, what uh, Afghanistan's um, peace and stability could bring to neighboring states and to uh, the region as a whole, um, the, the benefits that it could bring. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I mean, uh, Afghanistan has always been um, a, a, a ground for a proxy wars of uh, neighboring countries. Well, let's just go to Tony Schaffer very quickly on that particular issue. Uh, we've been talking doom and gloom, but is there the possibility that Afghanistan can get through this process, can have successful elections, and can, as we've heard, provide that impetus into the region, no longer to be the basket case, but actually to be a powerful positive force? Is there that possibility? Oh, there is, and I agree that uh, we need to look at stabilizing Afghanistan. That would actually help the Pakistanis. Pakistan sits that fence. I think the, there's a real issue there. But let me be very clear. You know, the Afghan people, I, I really get upset when people talk about giving the Afghan people back their, the, the, the democracy. The Afghan people have always been self-governed, self-democracy. The question now becomes, can they take that self-democracy, the tribalism, and put it together and make a larger whole so the whole country can benefit? They have to become a, a strong, solid country to, to really deal with these outside influences, which really clearly are not in their interest to, uh, at all. So I'd like to believe that as we move forward here, that we see this peaceful transition to a new democracy, we will sustain ourselves by sufficient international aid coming in to help get that entrepreneurial process going and sufficient military force to help protect it all. There's huge resources in Afghanistan, natural resources and great uh, potential for economic development. We need to really focus on that. And if we can do the economic development and maintain and protect the people of Afghanistan, anything is possible. Well, at all order, but at that particular point, my thanks to our guests, Omar Samat in Washington, D.C., Helena Malikia in Kabul, and Tony Schaffer in Washington as well. And do please let us know your thoughts by adding to the discussion on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now.